good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webcast entitled Fair Use and Research Librarians. Submit a question or comment at any time during the webcast. Please click on the Ask a Question button at the bottom of your screen. Simply type your message into the box and click on the Submit button. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Brandon Butler. Sir, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody, um, all many, many of you. <laughs> Welcome to the debut webcast for the Code of Best Practices and Fair Use for Academic and Research Libraries. Uh, my name is Brandon Butler. I'm ARL's Director of Public Policy Initiatives, um, and I'm lucky enough to be one of the co-facilitators for this code. Uh, and the first thing I want to say is please send us your questions. You can use that, do that using the web interface uh, that you're looking at right now. Um, and at the end of the presentation, if we get time, we will work through as many questions as we can. Um, but we have a lot to cover. So given how many of you there are and how much we have to get through, uh, we're probably not going to get to all the questions that we get. But even if we don't get to your question, we are going to hold on to all of the things that you tell us um, and use that to guide our education and outreach efforts going forward. We have a series of FAQs on our website, and all of that stuff is going to evolve and grow with your help. So uh, also, finally, you can always reach out to me personally. Uh, my email is brandon at arl.org um, with your questions and concerns about the code. Um, I also want to acknowledge up front that this work was done with support, generous support from a grant uh, from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Uh, and this uh, work has been done in collaboration with two wonderful scholars who've helped shape fair use practice, and they're both on the line with me today. Uh, first is Patricia Alfterheide. Uh, she is founder and director of the Center for Social Media at American University. And Peter Yazzie, who is a distinguished copyright and fair use scholar and is director of the Glushko Samuelson Intellectual Property Law Clinic at the American University Law School. And now I'm going to turn it over to Peter, uh, who will give you all a bit of a primer on fair use law and an overview of how the code has been grounded in these powerful legal principles. So, Peter. Thank you so much, Brandon, and, and thank you all for, I don't know what the expression is, but I'll, I'll reveal my age and say tuning in. Uh, the, the first thing I want to say is probably uh, something very, very widely understood and recognized about the purpose of copyright law. And that is that copyright law really exists for one and one purpose only. And excuse my, my mess with the slides here. There, that's where I want to be. And that is to promote culture and learning. So we can see that the, the core constitutional purpose of copyright law is very, very close to the core mission of academic libraries and librarians. They share a great deal, and so they should. Now, the mode by which copyright law promotes the goals of culture and learning is primarily by rewarding creators and encouraging new makers to use existing culture. But sometimes copyright can actually get in the way of responsible culture promoting activities and that's where the principle of balance in copyright comes in and of course balance is implemented in our copyright statute through provisions that are referred to generally as limitations and exceptions and those include specific limitations and exceptions which are extremely important but quite narrowly drawn, like sections 108 and 109 and 110 and 121, about which I'll be speaking in context in a moment. And perhaps most important of all, the general category of limitations and exceptions includes fair use, the doctrine of American copyright law that's dynamic and flexible and that authorizes certain uses without authorization by of copyrighted works in ways that aren't directly tied either specifically to the nature of the use or specifically to the character of the user. And it's probably worth noting in, in passing that the Supreme Court has specifically identified this fair use doctrine of, of copyright law with the freedom of expression imperatives that receive constitutional expression in the First Amendment. 
Now, this fair use doctrine was first articulated way back in the 1840s, and it, it ran quietly in the background as a kind of judge-made safety valve in the copyright system until 1976, when the copyright statute was amended all sorts of changes, and the fair use doctrine as it had developed in the courts was, was quietly and, and in a very sort of uh, unspectacular way embedded in the new law as Section 107. Now, we know about the Section 107 provisions and their their focus on the so-called four factors, the, the nature of the use and the, the, the kind of material used, the amount of the use and the market effect of the use. And we also know, if we've worked or practiced in this field, that fair use analysis based exclusively on the four factors was a source of a good deal of frustration in the years after 1978 when the new law took effect. And I think that frustration arose particularly because various communities of practice, like libraries, couldn't easily use this statutory formulation as a way of, of predicting or understanding when things they did would or should be considered as fair use. They weren't alone. I think that frustration was very widely felt. And in response to that frustration, the courts have taken a, a new tack in the years since 1994 when the Supreme Court specifically embraced the approach I am going to describe to fair use analysis. Specifically, in most fair use cases today, courts ask two questions, and those questions determine the answer. So just as those are the two questions that courts can ask, so they are the two questions that a user, considering whether or not a particular use should be considered fair, can ask in advance of making that use. The first is whether the use is transformative. Does it add value to the material that's being used? And does it repurpose that material, directing it to a new audience or, or for a new goal? And the second is whether or not the amount of material used is appropriate to that transformative purpose. Those are extremely important insights, and they have added tremendously to our ability to make forward judgments about likely outcomes in fair use analysis, which were difficult or impossible to make under a, an approach to fair use founded exclusively on the four factors. In addition, we've got quite a few cases from the last couple of decades, none of them about education and libraries, but about all sorts of other uses that help us to understand better how this new transformativeness-based approach to fair use analysis works. And we know something else, and we know this by virtue of the work of, of diligent IP scholars who have poured over all of the cases decided over 150 plus years looking for patterns. We know that when practice communities who engage in similar kinds of culture promoting activities speak clearly as a group about their shared values, courts that are trying to figure out what uses should be considered fair, especially in a new context, pay attention to that professional consensus. And that insight is the immediate springboard for the codes of best practices and fair use that we've been working with different practice groups to devise over the last six or seven years at American University are concerned, including, of course, the one that we're talking about today. And with that, I think I will turn the, the floor, if there can be said to be a floor here, over to my wonderful colleague, Pat Alfterheide of the Center of Social Media to talk more about the best practices codes, where they come from and what they do. 
Uh, thank you very much, Peter. It has been a great, great privilege to work with uh, a variety of different communities of practice as they faced and to first learn about the problems that they faced in employing fair use and then facilitate the creation of a code of best practices that in general has made it much easier for those people to responsibly use fair use. And you see on this slide a number of the communities that we have worked with. I'm going to take you through the first community which has had the longest experience with that uh, with that, those codes, which is the documentarians. When uh, we first began working with them in 2004, they found themselves bound uh, to, uh, by and large, a misunderstanding of, of copyright law, uh, in which they believed that fair use was, was way too risky for them to even think about. And um, they also faced a situation where their insurers, which were required for them to get television um, airing, were were not accepting fair use claims even when they dared to do so. So they were simply ruling out large areas of reality in, in their attempts to make films. Once they created a code of best practices, it was su surprising to them what happened. It certainly was uh, surprising to us how quickly it happened. Uh, within uh, three months of the code being uh, issued, these films, uh, three films that used heavily, uh, heavily used a lot of, them of fair use went to Sundance and got picked up for airing. Probably the single most biggest change for them is that within a year, every insurer of errors and, uh, for errors and omissions accepted fair use claims, and they now do so without accepting any incremental costs. So in the case of the documentary filmmakers, you have very clear examples of why uh, it's it's um, important to to, um, uh, to to use these rights, and the insurers have made a very clear statement that they believe that, given the code, they have lowered their risk. Um, in oh, so sorry, I'm learning how to do my slideshows. Uh, these all of these codes have had pretty um, direct effects on people's ability to use um, uh, their fair use rights and therefore a direct effect on their ability to meet mission. And the best practices have been united by their approach, which is that none of them are guidelines, none of them are rules. They assert principles in situations. So they take a situation that is common to the, to the, to the mission-driven uh, practice of the field, and they assert why fair use applies here, and then they say where it stops and um, and where what the limits are, and um, the the goal is to encourage people's case by case reasoning, not give them rote answers. And with that, I'd like to turn it back to my legal colleagues, or not. Oh, great. So, uh, so why does fair use matter to librarians, right? So we've talked a lot about fair use generally and how some other communities um, have, have taken this best practices movement and made it their own. Uh, what happened, what, what's, what's at stake for librarians? Why did we decide that this would be a useful exercise for you guys? Well, first of all, we looked at the community and what, what do libraries do? And fair use could really be helpful for the mission of libraries. Um, the mission is, right, to preserve knowledge, to make it available, to serve the teachers, the students, the professors, and the scholars um, in the past, you know, from the past, the present, and the future, right? So all these people need access to library materials. They need access in a variety of formats and a variety of ways, and they need those materials to last. Um, how can librarians do that when those materials are encumbered, many, most of those materials that people really want access to, encumbered by copyright, which says you, know, you, can't, trans you can't transfer things from one format to the other, or you can't uh, do certain digital things with these, with these works because that implicates copyright. So clearly, um, and especially as, as, as new technologies become available, copying uh, becomes implicated more and more frequently in the sort of normal day-to-day -day activities of librarians. But uh, it turns out that uh, there's a lot of 
there's a lot of insecurity and hesitation out there about applying a doctrine that's flexible, understandably. And the fair use doctrine, as you saw early on, those four factors, they don't really answer the question once and for all on their face, right? They don't tell you how many copies can you make or where can you put them and so on. And that leaves people wondering, what, what can I really do? And when people are insecure and when they hesitate, that costs money and it costs time and it costs access and mission uh, uh, for, for, for students and faculty and scholars, right? Um, fair use would help, but folks, again, are, are worried about how to apply it appropriately. And what we saw in, uh, in the research that we did initially on what librarians are doing right now was that risk aversion was really substituted for any kind of uh, fair use analysis and risk management. So folks would try and say, well, you know, have I heard of this author? Well, in that case, that's something I'm, I don't want to get into, or do I know that this person is litigious? And, and that, those are things that obviously any rational person should consider, but that was it. That was the beginning and the end of the analysis for some folks, and they didn't really know how fair use could play a part of their kind of risk management calculus. So we created this code of best practices for you guys, um, and actually we didn't create it, we just sort of helped you create it. Uh, we went out and spoke with librarians uh, in, in a really deep and deliberative way. So we spoke with 90 librarians uh, representing 64 different institutions across nine four-hour discussion sessions uh, held all over the country. So we got people together and uh, in quiet rooms, as Mitt Romney would say, and we talked about things that people are scared to talk about in public. We talked about these challenges and these problems, and then we had people sort of you know, look at, you know, talk amongst themselves and, and consider their values and consider their missions and answer these challenges. What are the best ways forward given what we know about fair use? And we would tell them about transformativeness, give them some of the same kind of material that we've just given you and said, you know, guided by your values and these, and, and these basic principles, how can you meet these challenges? Um, but we didn't just sort of take the word of you know, librarians for the, for the final word on the law, right? We, these values are very important, and we believe deeply that the values of the librarians are important, or we wouldn't have gone forth with this project. But um, to make sure that we weren't, you know, going uh, out on a limb, going too crazy, we brought in a diverse panel of outside legal experts, people that uh, were not involved in this thing from the get-go and who don't have a stake in it, but who came in at the end of the day to take um, a, a look at it and say, does this look like it's within the bounds of reason, within the bounds of what a, a rational uh, lawyer could argue um, in terms of fair use? And so we know that, that the, the lunatics have not taken over the asylum. We have uh, the word of lawyers that this is all within reason, but it's ultimately motivated by librarians and what the librarians value. That makes this a, an important new input for this risk management process because you're never going to know for sure um, or, you know, probably not, no, no time soon what final answers there might be to these fair use questions. Um, the best you can do is come to approximations. And that means that there's always going to be some level of risk. And, and the job of a policymaker and a, and a research institution or an academic institution is putting these legal risks into perspective. How, how large are these risks really? And then also considering what, we would, what I would call mission risk, that is, what's the cost of not doing anything? What is our core value as a library? Um, and, and what do, what do uh, librarians think when they get the chance to think deeply about what we should do if we're true to our mission? Um, so consider the views of librarians as you're making these kind of risk management decisions. And then also uh, these, these sort of uh, these pr principles give a kind of kernel um, for the grounding of, of future solidarity. That is, this is what folks really thought when they could think freely and, and deeply amongst themselves. And, and going forward, librarians can make these principles the core of their new consensus around fair use. So. With, with, without any further ado, let's go ahead and move into the principles. And I'm going to, Peter Yazi and I um, were, the, were the, the two lawyers in the room who tried to sort of talk through these issues with the librarians. And let's see if we can work through the principles uh, pretty quickly. And, and we really must commend you t to you reading the, c the text of the code. We're not going to, we're not going to get into the details of each principle here. Um, we just want to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that the code covers. And uh, so without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Peter. Thanks, Brandon. I may make a couple of general observations before I get us started with principle number one. One is a, a descriptive 
one which may anticipate questions that, that some of you have, and that is well, what do we mean when we say a best practice? What are the kinds of consensus that we, we tried to isolate from the many discussions that Brandon described? I think it's fair to say that for purposes of this exercise, a, a best practice is something that some institutions, if not all, do, and that the community broadly views as appropriate. That even librarians who work in institutions where they have been told that for whatever reason they, they can't follow that practice believe that they should be able to. And the other thing I want to say is a comment in a different register. I, I think that some of you, as we go through the description of the principles and as you then follow Brandon's good suggestion and read the code, may be disappointed. You may find that the assertions of the entitlement to take advantage of fair use in this code aren't as bold or aren't as broad as you might have expected or might have liked. And that is, of course, again, because the best practices and their associated limitations arise from the community. And one thing we, we knew going in and had reinforced for us again and again throughout this exercise is that the library community, and librarians in particular as individuals, are great respecters of copyright. And I think in a way it's that fact, the fact that this is that these best practices are grounded not only in a sense of mission, but also in a countervailing respect for the institution of copyright. I think it's that circumstance, which although it may make some of the principles seem less bold than they might otherwise be, also makes them more robust. Let me start with the first. And the first principle is one of the ones that was, was discussed in, I think, in, in every group that we talk to, because it's a matter of very great interest. It's connected very much with, as Brandon mentioned a moment ago, the vast potential of new technology. And that is the question of what librarians can do with a warrant in fair use to support teaching and learning activities by providing digital access to library materials. And this includes e-reserves and course sites and streaming video and a number of other topics which are, of course, very much in the news and sometimes even controversially so. I want to emphasize, though, that for a lot of reasons, the discussions around this principle were limited to the digital environment. We haven't chosen, or the library community didn't choose, in devising these best practices to revisit, for example, the issues surrounding physical course backs. But where the digital environment is concerned, there was a very, very strong consensus. And that consensus was expressed as with respect with every one of the topics we're going to discuss today through a principal statement and a group of associated limitations. And I think it's very important to point out that these limitations are really integral to the principal statement. The principal, which in this case is that it's fair use to make appropriately tailored course-related content available to enrolled students on digital networks, that principal doesn't make sense, isn't complete, doesn't live, if you will, without the associated limitations in which the community believed with equal strength. So the avoidance of wherever possible of content that was produced specifically for the educational market. The limitation of access in terms of who can access the material and also in terms of when it can be accessed. An insistence on a nexus between the material that is made available and the pedagogical purposes of the instructor and, of course, full attribution wherever possible. And I'm going to pause for a moment on the last because the copyright scholars and practitioners in the group may be surprised because copyright law, of course, doesn't speak to the issue of attribution. That, in our view, wasn't a reason to exclude it 
from this integrated statement of principles and limitations. Because after all, this is once again a statement of by and for librarians, not an expression of free-floating copyright expertise. In connection with this topic, in connection with other topics to follow, the librarians felt very strongly that good practice, good faith practice always entailed appropriate attribution. And so, of course, we have included that as part of the faithful consensus statement of their beliefs. There are also some, some extra credit provisions that should be noted here and in connection with the principles that we'll discuss in the moment, the so-called enhancements. The the elements of an argument for fair use, which nobody regarded or most people didn't regard as essential, but which many felt would add weight if they could be implemented. So in, insisting on some kind of articulated rationale from instructors for a material that they posted online and, of course, periodic updating of online materials to ensure their continued relevance. Again, those are enhancements. They aren't integral, as are the limitations to the statement of the principle, but they were strongly subscribed to or strongly enough subscribed to to deserve a place in this document. Brandon? Thanks, Peter. So turning to the second principle, this was one where uh, I think that this, I really hope that this code can do a lot of good because the consensus was very, very strong. Uh, the case for transformativeness and, and, and fair use here is very, very strong. Um, but we, we had heard from people that, that they're, you know, in their institutions, they weren't going forward with confidence on, on this front. So the, 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 the subject of the principle is, is essentially exhibits. Uh, libraries using their collections materials in both physical and virtual exhibits. And the goals of, of these exhibits are uh, often scholarly, that is, they, they provide new uh, scholarly insights into the materials that are being uh, put on display. Um, but then there's also, you know, a, a perfectly legitimate kind of promotional purpose that is, look what we have at the library. You know, come, come and see more of what, the, what these sort of uh, interesting and unique things that we have available here. Um, um, and so librarians felt strongly that this is something we should be doing, um, you know, in the light of mass digitization and mass access to sort of popular stuff. The way that libraries distinguish themselves these days is often with their special collections, their unique things. And, uh, and so this making exhibits like this was a hugely popular practice, and yet something that was done kind of with, um, with a heavy heart due to fear about fair use. And... Uh, uh, but, but, you know, we found a really strong consensus that uh, using selections from collection materials to publicize the library's activities to create physical and virtual exhibits is a fair use. Um, one interesting uh, little uh, example that I actually just ran across was the National Library of Ireland has a fantastic exhibit on, on William Butler Gates. Um, so just Google that and check, out, check that out. That's a really paradigm case of what we're thinking, as it takes material from, you know, disparate material about the author and really sheds light on his work um, by putting it all together. It gives context. It's heavily curated. It's wonderfully interactive. Um, these projects are so valuable um, and so clearly fair. And so we, I really think there's a lot of value added here just to, to state that strongly uh, so that people can go forward. Um, and I think, you know, again, attribution comes up as a limitation. Um, you should use the appropriate amount. Um, but th this was a really, uh, an actually kind of an easy one. <laughs> it was nice to have an easy one um, after e-reserves, which is such a hot topic. Um, so with that, I think I will turn it back over to Peter. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, the, next, the next topic is, is digitization for preservation of at-risk items. And when we began this project in our initial conversations with librarians, we weren't sure how much of an issue this was going to be because there is, after all, as I mentioned earlier, a specific provision, Section 108, in the Copyright Act that carves out a pretty clearly defined, if somewhat narrow, space in which preservation can occur without regard to copyright ownership in the items preserved. But what we discovered when we began to talk with our 
informants in the library community is that in fact this was indeed a recurrent problem situation precisely because the limits of Section 8 are so narrowly defined and precisely because the library mission to preserve and maintain knowledge often would be served by digital preservation of material that isn't technically yet falling apart as Section 108 requires. And so it is perfectly clear from the copyright law as a technical matter that Section 108 doesn't define the limits of permissible library preservation activity. It's completely clear that, as is true of every one of the other specific exemptions in copyright law, the specific exemption here, Section 108 for preservation, is supplemented and complemented by the Fair Use Doctrine in Section 107. That which you cannot do technically under Section 108, you may still be able to do without liability under fair use. And so what we discovered was that there was broad consensus within the library community that regardless of the 108 limits, it should be considered fair use to make digital copies of collection items. If those items are, are likely to deteriorate, even if they aren't yet deteriorating, or that they exist only in difficult to, act, difficult to access formats. And that that preservation, that digital preservation, could be for two purposes. It could be simply to, to, to stabilize this body of knowledge, and it also could be to serve individuals, researchers, and others who were interested in the material so that by looking at a digital surrogate copy, they could save wear and tear on the increasingly fragile original. And as I say, this was a very, very strong consensus. But once again, the strength of the consensus incorporated the associated limitations, and some of them are significant, that there should be, in order for the principle to operate, no available substitute at reasonable cost. That in many cases, limitations should be imposed on the circulation of the material and on off-premises access by patrons. And of course, once again, attribution was a matter of tremendous importance. Once again, as well, there, there are enhancements. Sometimes, although not always, libraries may want to consider using technological protection measures to supplement the security on digital preservation items that are made available as surrogates. And, of course, the library ought always to consider providing a mechanism by someone who objects to, or providing a mechanism for someone who objects to a work in which they believe they own copyright being made available on this basis. I want to pause for just a second here before going back to Brandon and say something about this issue of technological protection measures. Because when you read the code, as you listen to us today and as you read the code thereafter, you'll see that there are a number of places, especially in these enhancement sections, where the librarians with whom we consulted felt that sometimes it might be a good idea to use some kind of technical security. And of course, many of us are very skeptical about technological protection measures. And I think, in 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 in, in general, with good me with good reason. Nevertheless, this was the view of the library community, and it is faithfully recorded here. On the the support page for this document, we have a, a short discussion of some of the different kinds of technological security measures that might be used by libraries that were interested in following this line of suggestion. And the point I want to underline, because it's easily missed, is that there are other less intrusive and less inconvenient forms of technological protection than heavy encryption. A password, 
in the right circumstances, maybe an effective technological protection measure, a watermark, likewise, and so on and so forth. So don't assume in this document that every time there's a suggestion that it might be appropriate to consider using technological protection, that necessarily means 128-bit encryption. Brandon? That's right, and, and there's actually one other interesting thing that deserves highlighting, which is this sort of notice and takedown uh, provision that we include in some of the uh, in some of the principles, and that's another that's another provision that you know if you know anything about copyright, you know that 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 that's a mechanism that can be abused. You know there are stories about abusive uh, t uh, takedown notices being issued, um, and so we were clear in each of these principles and and in the material surrounding the principles that. Uh, the the key, and this is what the, the librarians told us. You know, no one wants no one wanted a library to automatically and always um, take down uh, forever and ever um, any material based on any complaint. Um, the question, the key issue is to keep the lines of communication open um, and to be there and available for rights holders who f may have a legitimate claim. And that's that's the main thing. And and this this actually in in practice, uh, the folks that I know in libraries who have had these mechanisms in place say that in the vast, vast majority of cases, someone who does uh, come forward um, ends up saying, sure, go ahead and use it. I just wanted to be reassured about why you're doing this, where it came from, and so on. Um, so, you know, keep the lines of communication open. I think that's the only, uh, that's the only thing that the, the, the enhancements require. Um, and so you may be noticing a trend, right? Each of these principles have limitations. They have enhancements. These things are detailed. They're nuanced. Um, and, and as Peter said, all of this stuff is really essential um, to understanding each principle. You can't sort of read the principles on their own um, because the principles on their own can sound kind of bold, and they were meant to be conditioned by um, this uh, additional material. So now back to our, uh, our countdown. So principle four deals with special collections um, and archival materials. And the librarians found uh, a, a strong consensus that it is a fair use to create digital collections, uh, to create digital versions of libraries, special collections, and archives, and to make these versions electronically accessible in appropriate contexts. And the, the key here was that having a kind of digital aggregate, creating something with an identity as a collection, really was a powerful concept um, that, that creates a new value, that gives it that transformativeness that we talked about early on in the presentation. Um, these, these collections are truly special. You know, the, they're unified by a theme. They're things that are typically rare, unique even, one of a kind. And so, uh, Putting these things together is not um, is not uh, something is something that libraries have always done, and making them available is something that libraries have always done. And, and librarians felt that this was you know that moving into the digital world in this way was continuing in a very noble tradition. Um, you know, again, we've got you know we have our limitations and our enhancements. Uh, and again, there is there's a kind of carve out for you know if you can find unused copies on the market at reasonable prices, you know that's a real red flag um, because again there you're talking about competing with somebody um, that's out there on the market and that's something that libraries have never been have never done. Um, so that was something that that raised a red flag for folks. Um, and there were a few other interesting nuances. And again, I'm, I I can't tell you enough to read the code, look at look at what's what's in there because you really um, you, there's a really rich, uh, a really rich discourse going on in there that, that needs to be applied. There's no simple way to describe each one of these things. Um, and I'll turn it over to Peter for the next one. Thanks, Brandon. When we did the initial interviews, trying to isolate what the what the the recurrent problem situations that librarians faced were, we discovered that there was quite a lot of uncertainty, frustration, and even occasionally fear around the question of how far libraries could go to make collection materials accessible to students, especially students with print disabilities, through copying them into new formats. And 
this is one of those areas where, once again, the copyright law contains a provision, Section 121, the so-called Chafee Amendment, that, that speaks directly to this question and, and creates a sort of safe harbor for these practices. The trouble is that although librarians, I think correctly, but it's a personal view, tend to read or to wish to read Section 121 broadly, others whose opinions happen to be taken into account, like the publishing industry, read it very narrowly. So it simply isn't clear at the end of the day how much or how little um, provision of accessible copies to print disabled students is really covered. One thing we know, once again, as I said before about Section 108, is that Section 107 and fair use complement Section 121, that even in situations where Section 121 doesn't reach, the fair use doctrine may apply. And, and that was the conclusion of the groups, and again, this was a very, very strongly held general consensus, that unless you can get fully accessible copies from a commercial source, then it's fair use for the library to reproduce collection materials in accessible formats on request from disabled students and in order to avoid the, the cruel inefficiency and delay which is involved in repeating the act of scanning materials on the occasion of every request, it's also all right to retain those reproductions for use in meeting, although only in meeting, subsequent requests from qualified, that is to say, disabled patrons. So the limitations are ones that you can see that, that users, the beneficiaries of this kind of system, need to be instructed about their rights and, and responsibilities, the things they can and can't do with the materials they receive. That under some circumstances, time limits on the material made available could be appropriate if something is a, a three-hour reserve book in its physical form, then perhaps some time limitation, although not necessarily a three-hour limitation, may be appropriate when that same book is made available to blind patrons, for example, as a simple matter of fairness, and also that libraries should work closely with the disability services offices of their universities because in most institutions there these are these are shared responsibilities under the enhancements there's some discussion again of the possible use of technological protection measures in certain circumstances and there is the statement which i find very interesting and again it arose entirely out of these conversations that the case for fair use will probably be better the more widely known this library service feature becomes. Brandon? Thanks, Peter. So the next the next principle deals with institutional repositories, and this was again a, a fascinating question um, that was a, a huge issue for folks, especially institutions that are using kind of third party contractors to run their IRs, because they found that you know a grad student would would be putting together a project, and at the very last, like literally the last minute, you know they're they're submitting their thesis, they're submitting their dissertation, they're ready to graduate. And suddenly they're confronted with a kind of contract that says, um, do you certify that you have permission uh, for every third-party piece of material that's in your dissertation or thesis? And suddenly their, draw, you know, their jaw hits the floor and um, they get out the editor's pen and start cutting out still frames from their thesis on film history or cutting out uh, lengthy quotations from their thesis uh, in English literature or whatever, and people people freak out and they and they suddenly change their research, um, or or if they are confronted with this information early on, their research choices are shaped sometimes by fear about incorporating material into their scholarship, and so we. We, when we spoke with the librarians in the focus groups, um, it came out quite strongly that, that this is a problem and that libraries should be sort of sticking up for their users in a way and saying, you know, look, if you are doing transformative work, if the, if, if the 
putting material into your dissertation or thesis is doing what scholarship does, that is illustrating the idea, commenting, critiquing, and so on, well, then we should stand up for that, and, uh, and that fair, it should be a fair use to include that material into the IR. Um, if it's a fair use to write it, then it's a fair use to deposit it, and it's a fair use for the library to share it in, the, in those libraries where the IR materials are publicly accessible. Um, and in the case of those publicly accessible IRs, though, Again, uh, we wanted, the librarians felt strongly, and we wanted to reflect that consensus that, you know, if, if a rights holder comes forward, there should be a fairly easy way for somebody to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, something of mine got lumped into an appendix here, and I think it's too much, I think it's not fair, I don't think this is a, a legit fair use, and let's, let's work it out. So there should be a mechanism in place for working out that kind of, that kind of conflict. Um, and then this was something that came up in a lot of the principles, because really libraries are so often facilitators. Um, it's important when libraries are facilitating you know, things like depositing work, when a, when a student is depositing work, or when a professor is using an e-reserves or course management system, it is uh, so helpful um, for libraries to provide education to these folks. You know, give some give some basic information about fair use, um, so that these people can use their rights and use library materials responsibly. Um, help them help them uh, give proper attribution and so on. Um, the fair use case would actually be even stronger. Uh, the librarians felt if there was even a policy, if that is, if you go beyond giving some general information about fair use and really kind of um, give written guidance or give more uh, strict guidance that would be that would give students a clearer idea of what's in and what's out. And then uh, if you can provide individualized advice, that's even better. But again, these enhancements are sort of above and beyond. We know that you know, not every library can have a copyright lawyer on staff to do this kind of stuff. And so if you can do it, it's good to do it. But, but these, are, these are the super erogatory um, acts, not the required ones. And Peter, I'll turn it over to you for the next one. Thank you. So the, the six situations we've talked about so far are things that in one way or another have been around in the library world for a long time. People have had a good deal of time to think about them first as they arose in the physical world and even now over several decades um, as they were presented in the, the, the digital space. But the topic of Principle number seven is actually an emergent topic, one that a few institutions have begun to confront, although many others have, have yet to d directly consider. And here I want to emphasize that although many of the institutions in which the librarians who spoke with us work had not yet addressed this question, there was extraordinarily broad unanimity in support of an approach that has been and or is being followed by the relatively few who have, and that's the best practice we're talking about here. The issue is creating databases for non-consumptive research. Let's suppose that I'm a scientific researcher who wants to know, oh, how often a particular mouse model, the Onco mouse, for example, is used in bio, biomedical research that is reported in major scientific journals. Well, the best way to do that is to create a big database of all of those scientific journals and then simply run a query over the whole database for Oncomouse. And you will get a number of hits, and that number of hits will give you information that is separate and apart from meta information, if you will, information separate and apart from whatever the contents of the journal articles that were included in that database may be. And the same could be true of databases of 20th century novels that are being scanned for some other marker, the frequency with which a character name is used, or, or whatever. So this 
activity is is now generally being referred to under the rather 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 icky name of non consumptive research. We don't have a better term for it, and so that's the one that's been used here. The library community was very, very strong in its consensus that it's fair use for libraries to develop such databases in order to enable this kind of non-consumptive analysis. There are some very important integrated limitations, of which, of course, the most important is that when the community says that it's fair to create databases for non-consumptive research, they mean, of course, only for non-consumptive research and not necessarily for any other purpose. Another possible form of non-consumptive research that was considered and endorsed by the librarians who thought about this principle were, of course, reference uses that are a classic and, 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 and time-honored example of non-consumptive research in the library setting. The limitations are worth looking at. Um, if possible, the better the metadata, the stronger the claim for this database this, this non-consumptive research database being a fair use will be. And likewise, the claim will be better when libraries get together and pool these resources. Because since the whole point of fair use is to enable and fulfill the goal of copyright law to promote culture, the more libraries can create comprehensive databases for non-consumptive research by sharing, the better that goal will be fulfilled. Brandon, you can finish. All right. So this is our last one, and it's very similar uh, in, in, uh, to the previous one insofar as it's really a bleeding edge uh, kind of issue in, in some respects. Um, and it really kind of ex exemplifies how the best practices project works. Um, so principle eight deals with making topically based collections of web-based material, right? So going out on the web and uh, doing to a certain extent on a smaller scale, probably, than Google, what Google does. That is, find, taking websites, um, copying them to your own local server um, for your own local purposes. And this was something that some libraries are doing, but certainly not everyone. And the, the, so the question, there was no question of, you know, sort of finding out what everyone's doing and just saying, go do that. Um, rather, typically, there would be, uh, there's, typically, there's just a, a couple of folks that could say, here's what my institution is doing. And then everyone else in the room would have to sort of think in the abstract, well, we're not doing that yet. That's pretty cutting edge. That's pretty interesting. What's the right way to do it? If I were to do it, would I do it that way or would I do it a different way? Um, so we had some really fascinating and wide-ranging discussions about this. Um, but it came down pretty strongly uh, that it is fair use to create these sort of collections of websites from the Internet. And, and you can imagine the sort of underlying intuition here that you know, the Internet is where you know, huge swaths of content now lives. If libraries are going to continue to sort of uh, represent a cross-section of our cultural record and our cultural history, if you're going to collect in you know, sort of cutting-edge areas, if you're going to talk about human rights, how can you talk about the Arab Spring without having sites on hand and without collecting sites before they disappear um, that people created during that movement, right? So to, to, to document social movements, to make that stuff accessible, and, and to make those things accessible and available in the future in ways that their current creators really, frankly, you know, didn't have in mind, right? When I make a website uh, as part of my protest movement, I'm trying to get people on the street. And in 20 years, when that movement is gone, it will still be interesting to look at that website. And, it's, and, and there was a really powerful feeling in, in the folks that we spoke with that it cannot be the case that because those sites are copyrighted and because those people are long gone half the time and you can never find them, that libraries should throw up their hands and not do their job. So collecting web-based material, we thought, was a really powerful case for fair use. And that sort of that wraps up our kind of summary of the, the principles. I think I'm going to hand it over to, to Pat now to sort of talk about um, where these principles live, some of the other stuff that's out there, and, and, uh, and, and what you can do to help. 
Thank you so much, Brandon. Yes, the the um, this is this is the part where it's it's terribly important how you use the code because the, the fair use is like a muscle. You use it or you lose it. And practice the practice of employing fair use will change the practice of the field. So we're uh, we're happy to tell you that there is lots more information uh, available to help you both use the code and to tell other people about the code. We've made a video for you. We have, uh, we've made slideshows. We've made FAQs. The FAQs will grow with the questions that we are harvesting now from, then you have some excellent questions on the, on the site. And we've, we've, uh, cross-posted this material at three different websites, all of which you have the URLs for on the code itself. If you want to have a, a, a deeper look at uh, at, at how fair use has evolved to make transformativeness in this contextual question so central. Uh, you could read the book that Peter Yossi and I have written, Reclaiming Fair Use, $12 on Amazon. And we would love for you to share this information with others. Uh, if you want to use it whole, just go ahead and do that. Otherwise, employ your fair use rights when you excerpt. And we'd like to add another special thank you to the Andrew Mellon Foundation and to research librarians everywhere. Thank you all. Thank you. And let me add one thing, and that is that, as you'll see when you go to the support pages, <coughs> some of us are going to be going out over the next few months around the country doing events at libraries in different regions, which will be uh, open to anyone from that region who wants to attend, and which I think in every case now will also be webcast. And we would really encourage anyone who wants to know more about this document, and in particular who wants to talk, because we'll have lots of time then to talk. We won't have an hour. We'll have three or three and a half hours to talk. Who wants to talk about what could be done with these best practices in an institutional setting, we really would encourage you to, to come along or, 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 or join us on the web for one of those events. Absolutely. Please, please come see us. And, uh, you know, if, if you'd like us to come visit you, you can reach out to me, Brandon, at ARL.org, and we can talk about uh, uh, things that we're doing in your region. Um, so we have a lot of interesting questions um, that have been posed in the room, and a couple of ones that I just want to uh, pass through real quickly. Yes, you can post the entire PDF on your university's LMS. You can do anything you want with this PDF. Um, it's it's out there, and it is it is you know we want you to download it, we want you to upload it, we want you to send it, you know do whatever you want with it. It's wide open for you guys to use. Um, you know it would hurt me a little bit if you sold it, but you know if you can make some money, let me know. Maybe we should talk about a partnership. Don't round um, fish, please. <laughs> Um, but uh, and then we have just a couple of minutes, and there's one interesting question we have that, that I think we should maybe address, um, which is, you know, we say in the document that it's not legal advice, right? But obviously, we are trying to get people to have a certain view of what the law allows. So there's a gap there, right? So our, how how do we bridge that gap? What is are, are we worried that librarians are going to take our advice? Why did we say it's not legal advice? And um, I don't know, Peter, maybe you can answer that question since you've been giving this kind of uh, not legal advice, legal yeah, I mean, advice that's, for a long that's, time. I'm afraid that, that is what amounts to a standard disclaimer. In other <laughs> words, one thing that nobody can do, even if, even if they have a, a law certificate, is to advise someone who isn't their client about a specific problem. But lots of people, whether or not they have legal certificates, can, and in my view should, be giving information about legal principles that readers or viewers can take and incorporate into their own decision-making process, which may well include talking to a lawyer at some point. 
So I don't see, I, I, there's really no inconsistency. We, we want it to be clear that even if, even if you should recognize yourself or think you recognize yourself in this document, we aren't speaking directly to you as your lawyers. We're giving you general advice, advice we hope you can use to establish a process for thinking about these questions and to make arguments and presentations to the decision makers in your institution who may be in themselves have who may themselves have different levels of risk tolerance. That's right. That's right. So this is this is this is supposed to give you some guidance um, and, and help you approach these questions. And it's an input into a process that's going to have lots of people involved. They're going to have you know with lots of perspectives. There's a lot to to apply to any given problem. And so this isn't meant to settle uh, any any particular problem, much less all fair use problems, uh, once and for all. But we really hope that it will be a helpful input for everyone. And uh, it looks like we've come to the end of our time. Um, but I thank you all so much for joining us. Again, uh, you can get much more uh, information at our at our respective websites, and um, and we hope that we will uh, be in touch with you in the future more about this code and uh, and about fair use. So watch thank you the much. online FAQs because th those of you whose questions we couldn't address are, I hope, going to see your answers reflected there. And if not, please be in touch. That's exactly right. We'll, we'll get an archive of all these questions, and they are going directly into the hopper, and we'll, and we'll go directly onto the FAQ in some way or shape or form in the coming days. So thank you for your input, and I hope everybody has a great afternoon. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. That does conclude today's webcast. We thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect your lines and have a great day.